evening, everybody. I am Chan Chandler, or Chan Tagliabu. I'm a member of the Regents Committee for Georgetown's um, Kennedy Institute of Ethics, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you he here tonight. This evening is part of an annual series hosted by the KIE in which the campus community gets the chance to explore the implications of compelling issues presented by today's rapid medical and technological advances. This year's topic, Making Families, looks at the expanding possibilities of building loving families. Since the family is considered by most to be the basic building block of society, expanding our understanding of family to match the current realities of how families are made is of critical importance. Tonight we will consider the changes already in place and the questions they raise for society. These include people both straight and gay, legally married or not, coupled or single, becoming parents through sperm and egg donation, surrogacy arrangements, and adoption. All of these stretch our understanding of traditional family and are occurring at a rate that often feels too fast to make considered wise policy decisions. In our personal experience, our son realized he was gay in his sophomore year of college, 1989, eons ago. When he told us, we first thought that we had become a different family, one with a gay child and a straight child, and that our future lives and their future lives would be very unlike those we had imagined. Now we consider that we could not be more normal with both children married to spouses of long-term relationships and living traditional lives just like we had imagined. Our son Drew and his husband Mark were married on December 21st, 2013 in the 21st year of their relationship. Although the wedding was a hastily planned event, all things came together in the height of the Christmas season to make it seem as though it was preordained. The same Episcopal priest who had married our daughter in 1996, who had known our children since they were teenagers, was available, telling our son, I would go anywhere, anytime to marry you. Family and friends joyfully attended their marriage in the Bethlehem Chapel of the Washington National Cathedral using for the first time at the cathedral the new Episcopal liturgy written for same-sex marriages. It was a beautiful and symbolic occasion. Our desire, that is Paul's and mine, that all families would be able to embrace their gay children and love them as they are led us to endow the LGBTQ Resource Center here at Georgetown. We are indeed fortunate that Georgetown takes a moral leadership in this area and that the center is led by a visionary and creative advocate, Shiva Subaraman, who is here tonight. Shiva deserves the credit for taking our support and giving it the passion and relentless energy necessary to fulfill our gift. My hope is that tonight's conversation will broaden our perspectives on families and that we will begin to consider how we might best support all people in their desires to be part of a loving family. It is my pleasure now to turn the evening over to Maggie Little, professor in the philosophy department and director of the Kennedy Institute so that she can convene tonight's discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chan. I could not be more thrilled to be starting this evening's conversation with all of you and with the panelists we've convened 
uh, and the special guests in the audience, which start with Chan, who with her husband Paul have been extraordinary leaders um, for LGBTQ uh, presence and welcome in our community. Um, we have some other wonderful guests. I'd like to single out Fran Buckley, who's another regent of Georgetown and alum, whose founding gift started this series two, three years ago now. So thank you for your vision and your generosity, Fran. <laughs> Channels already mentioned Shiva. Where are you, Shiva? You have to stand up. Thank you, Shiva, for your leadership. It also wouldn't be an evening about families if we didn't have some families present, so I'm delighted that Charles DeSantis, who's the Vice President of Benefits here at Georgetown, and his wonderful husband David, and their four gorgeous children are here tonight. Can you guys stand up and say hi to the audience? Hi. Um, we're here tonight to talk about making families and some of the progress that has happened in the last few decades in expanding the notion of how we can build loving and stable families and give all of them equal protection and respect. To help us talk about this issue tonight, we have five fabulous um, panelists. Um, I'm going to introduce them and then describe how we're going to convene the conversation. Um, we're, I was mentioning to somebody in the reception ahead of time, Tonight we're doing a mashup of MTV and the Supreme Court. Okay, so the first two panelists who will join me on the stage to talk about their experiences are Bree and Halit, who were both members of the MTV docu series called Generation Cryo, um, which followed their experiences on finding out that they were born from sperm donors. Uh, and found one another through the course of this documentary, and they're going to share some of their experiences um, meeting, uh, 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 confronting this issue, and also meeting half-siblings, or what are sometimes called diblings, for donor siblings, and what a family they've made for each other. Um, we'll then uh, turn toward our panel of folks who work on this issue uh, um, in various professional capacities. Uh, unbelievably honored to have Mary Bonato here, um, Mary has been called the chief architect of the battle for marriage equality in the United States. Um, amongst many other momentous occasions, she helped to argue Obergefell, the Supreme Court case that in June of last year offered nationwide, nationwide protection for same-sex marriage. She'll be sharing some of what it took to get to this place. We'll also be welcoming to the stage Barry Stevens, who's an amazing um, award-winning documentary filmmaker who has a quite extraordinary story about how he found out that he was one of the very early uh, donor, uh, 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 children born from donor uh, sperm, or as he likes to call it, uh, donor providers, because they're often paid. And the story that he went through to find um, his uh, information about his uh, donor uh, um, progenitor and um, the two documentaries that he made, um, uh, Offspring and Biodad, uh, you'll hear his quite amazing story and the leadership he's uh, played in the policy community around this. And finally, we'll have Susan Crocken, um, one of our dear colleagues at the Kennedy Institute. She's a star of Georgetown. She's in the Law Center. She teaches what she calls repro law, which is looking at the incredibly complex legal landscape that has to try to confront the idea of family when you start bringing in third parties in reproduction. So she'll be talking to us about her experience with assisted reproduction. Um, so let's go ahead and start the conversation. I'd like to ask first Bree and Halit to join us on the stage. So the two of you are in your early 20s. When you were about 17, if I'm remembering correctly, you got approached by, and the producers in the audience, <laughs> Joshua <laughs> High, the producer from the MTV series, you got approached by MTV to join a project that was going to chronicle 
your explorations as people who were born with the help of a sperm donor to build a family. And you two hadn't met before this. No. And uh, you both had known about um, your story of origin, but learned a lot through the making of this documentary. So I'd, I'd love to hear, maybe Bree, we could start with you. Take us back to your childhood first. Okay. How did you learn that you were born with the help of a sperm donor, and what did that sort of mean to you and your family? Um, well, I was brought into the world with two moms, so I obviously, they needed some help, and it was um, apparent from the beginning because all of my friends all of my friends were donor conceived as well with two moms. Mm -hmm. um, it was never a secret and they always tried to make sure I understood it the best I could for my age. Um, and as I grew up, my mom split up so it um, became more of a secret because I was living with my biological mom who had then decided that she wanted to be with men. Mm -hmm. So um, she brought me around some guy she was dating until she found a husband and he um, he was homophobic and and my mom was on his side and so I didn't get to see my other mom very much and they were going to court so that my other mom could get the rights to see me mm -hmm. uh, as any other parent should and um, so after my mom split up with my other mom, it became kind of more of a secret mm -hmm. because she didn't want, my biological mom didn't want to see me getting hurt and she thought that if I was open about my life and where I came from, I would be getting hurt. Um, so, yeah. So that. you had known sort of forever because right. of your circumstances. It was normal in a sense to you, but then when your family circumstances changed, it, 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 it became a, a secret to others. Um, so you weren't really able to share it, like even with your friends when you were at that stage? Yes, um, and I felt uncomfortable sharing it with my friends because I grew up thinking that it wasn't okay to talk about and I went, um, I went to schools, I went to private schools that were religious and mm -hmm. um, they were very against gays, very against anything okay. um, had to do with it. So my other mom was I think everybody thought she was my grandma, and um, my mom was with another man at the time who would put his name on my birth certificate, and so he was my father. I was raised knowing he was my father, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, it <laughs> was kind strange. of uncomfortable. Yeah, I yeah. didn't want to talk to anybody about it, and I didn't want anyone to know about it for a very long time. I was scared. So what did that mean then when MTV comes to you and says, can we make a docu-series about your life? <laughs> well, by then I was a lot more comfortable with the whole idea of it and I had been, um, I started opening up with close friends when I was um, hitting middle school and then by the time I was in high school, which was when I was, or I was contacted by my producer, mm -hmm. um, I was very open about my life. Anybody who wanted to know could know about it and it was, mm -hmm. A beautiful thing. <laughs> so when MTV contacted me, I think it was it was after they contacted you guys and after they contacted a lot of my siblings yeah. and um, I just thought it was fun because I didn't think it was ever gonna happen. <laughs> so I was really excited. Good. Now Helly, your experience as the child born through a sperm donor was very different in terms of how your family dealt with it. So take us back to your childhood. So I was raised by a heterosexual couple. Um, I have a mom and I have a dad, and I consider my dad 100% my dad. He raised me, um, and for me that makes it a little different of a story than Bree or some of my other half-siblings. Um, they were very open with my twin brother Jonah and I since we were born. I knew what a sperm donor was, I knew what sex was, I knew what contraception was way before anyone else did. Any of my friends, sometimes even my friends' parents, would ask me what a sperm donor is, which was a little more uncomfortable when you're a seven-year-old trying to explain this, <laughs> when you don't really understand it yourself 100%. But um, we read storybooks, we read picture books about different types of conception using a sperm donor and for me 
I grew up in a really tight-knit community in Atlanta, and it was very open, and I really didn't receive any hate. There was not a lot of discrimination against my upbringing specifically. So mm -hmm. meeting my half-siblings, um, I connected with my first half-sister when I was eight years old through the donor sibling registry. Mm -hmm. and, and explain to people what that is. So donor the donor sibling, sibling registry is a website created by a single mom and her son who also used a sperm donor to conceive. And it's a website where you can type in your donor number because a lot of times donors are anonymous, so they have a number. You type mm -hmm. in the number and it connects you with other people who also used the same donor as you. And it was created, I think, a year or two before my mom signed up. And when she signed up and one of our half-sister's mom signed up, we were one of the first siblings to actually connect on the website back in 2003, um, which is crazy now thinking about how long ago it was. Mm -hmm. But we just grew up in a very, very open household. Um, in every manner of the word open and liberal and it was really never different for us. Um, it was kind of the cool fact that I could say when we were going around a circle and I could say, oh, I have 15 half-siblings and everyone else is like, okay, I can't follow that. <laughs> but yeah, it, and it, that's my favorite part about connecting with our half-siblings is that we each have different stories and they're so unique. Um, for every individual, for every family, and it's amazing and awesome to have this mm -hmm. great and awesome family and to be here with Brie. Oh. <laughs> totally. <laughs> well, now, picking up on what you said, Halid, about um, in talking of your childhood, for you, your father um, has always been your father. Mm -hmm. um, the sperm donor is a sperm donor. Um, and I think I remember you saying you've never really had any desire to find out the identity of the sperm donor. That just doesn't mean much to you. Mm -hmm. in, and in contrast, Brie, you've shared that you, you'd be really interested if you could find out the identity and, and know a bit about the person or even meet him. Right, definitely. I'm very fascinated with meeting him one day. I, ever since I was little, it was never even an option to not meet him one day. Mm -hmm. um, I've always wanted to. And it's, it's not exactly, I think that a lot of people are confused on, on why you would want to or wouldn't want to. But for me, I mean, it's very personal for everybody, but for me, it's 50% um, of my DNA came from him. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just love to That's know where I came from. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a lot, you know, a lot of me came from him. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that he's my parent at all. My parents raised me and helped me become who I am today. Yeah. But he's still a huge part of why I'm here. And I'm very interested in meeting him. Yeah. You've also both talked about this issue of um, one of the most powerful things that came out of participating in the docuseries was meeting your half-siblings. That. Right. Um, that yeah. you have this new, you just used the term, you have a new family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So they're, t talk about that, about how this experience is, has really changed your understanding of what family is. So I think this relates to your question to Brie about searching for the sperm donor. And like I was saying, we, we all were raised in very different types of families and upbringings. And just like that, Every single one of the siblings has an extremely different opinion on searching for the donor from me, I saw a picture one time but don't want to have any contact with him, to my twin brother who helped with the search but doesn't want to have contact, to other siblings who really would love to meet him. And through the entire process filming the show, we had to talk about that a lot and we got to have these tough, tougher conversations that we normally don't at our, in our um, homes wherever we grew up, mm -hmm. but learning about everyone's different beliefs and everyone's opinions, but still being close and being able to consider ourselves siblings and family really redefined what family means to me. And it was something that we talked about a lot was what does family mean? Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it's the people who support you and the people who you support. and. Not all of our half-siblings would be best friends if we weren't siblings. We are very different in a lot of ways. Um, but it's just like your own siblings or your cousins that you're family, um, mm. and you embrace that. And it, sh it showed me that it really doesn't matter um, what other people and who other people consider your family. It's about 
who you consider family. And I think that's up to everyone to decide for themselves. And that's what the cool thing about family is, is you can determine who you consider family and that's what makes them family and that what, that's what makes it so important to you. I don't know if you agree with that or if you have other totally. things to add. Um, yeah, I don't think I really knew what a family was before I met you guys. It was intense. Um, I came from a lot of weird, broken families, and I learned at a young age not really to rely on anybody and to be able to handle your own stuff. <laughs> and it was an incredible feeling being able to go through something so emotional and so public with people who understood and were there to support me. It was beautiful. Meeting, meeting my half-siblings was incredible. It was hard, but it was amazing. We got to hang out all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and we're all around, everyone's around our age, so we're all busy in school or working or doing our own thing. And it was so nice. It was a great time. Yeah. I wish we And I have to say, one of my favorite parts of this evening or aspects of it, um, I don't think I mentioned, Bree lives in Reno, Nevada. And Halit lives here in Washington, D.C. And so they've gotten to have a bit of a reunion just because of tonight's panel. And right. seeing the, first, the, the two of you find each other in the hallway was really a special sight. <laughs> yeah, okay, we get to hear more from you guys at the end when we'll have time for questions from the audience. But for now, let me ask you to go ahead and take your seats down there and we'll bring up the other panelists. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, we wanted to start with um, two young people, since we're at a college, at a university, sharing their experience of uh, growing up in a family that was made in an unusual way. And now we have the privilege of talking to three people who've, each of whom has a personal connection to this issue, but also works professionally in it to share their thoughts. And I've introduced Mary Bonato as the woman who argued before the Supreme Court, uh, Barry Stevens, the documentary, and uh, Susan Crocken, uh, the lawyer who helps with assisted reproduction. Mary, I, I'd love to start with you. Sure. So as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, this past summer saw a landmark decision. The Supreme Court decided um, in Obergefell that uh, same-sex marriages have to be protected in all states. Uh, you helped to argue the case. Love to hear a few war stories about that. But, 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 but what I think the, aud the audience may not fully remember or appreciate or know is how long it took us to get here. And you've been working on this battle for decades now. Um, tell us a bit about how did this journey start for this movement of marriage equality? Even though this is really hokey, it really starts in people's hearts because there have always been people, gay people, who've loved one another and wanted to marry. But there were times in this country when that was just inconceivable. But the first legal case came in the 1970s, and it was inspired by the best named Supreme Court case ever, mm -hmm. Loving versus Virginia, which was about Virginia's ban on interracial marriage, which had been around mm -hmm. since the colonial era. And in that case, the Supreme Court said the race ban was unconstitutional and that the freedom to marry belongs to all Americans that it's a vital personal right. Mm -hmm. And there were gay people in the 70s who dared to believe, might we be among all the, those Americans who, for whom this is a vital personal right? They got smacked down in court, to put it bluntly. Uh, and one couple appealed to the US Supreme Court, which dismissed their case for not even stating a federal question under the Constitution. Like it, as though marriage had nothing to do with those people. So that was really the beginning so you meant the, of the, the legal journey. The courts had wrapped their head finally around interracial marriage. But then when somebody tried to make the extension to same-sex marriage, it just wasn't even it's something not, they could wrap their heads around. Correct. It wasn't even an issue under the Constitution. So that had the effect of, of creating a precedent against us uh, that it took over 40 years to undo. I see. And I didn't enter the scene really until the early 1990s. Um, and in, in, in the early 1990s, the Hawaii Supreme Court made a preliminary ruling it made it look like uh, you know, the marriage bans had to be justified. The state was discriminating. It needed a reason. And I thought, battle's on. We've got to win this thing. Because uh, I, I remember yeah. you saying about So, So uh, understand, right, for the, the legal context until then, is it's not even a, po a legal possibility. And then suddenly Hawaii says, not that they, not that they ruled in favor of same-sex marriage, but it says, the burden's on the state, the government to explain why you would have a different rule 
based on sexual preference. Right? So that flips the burden, right? So now right. you come to the scene. Well, I had great hopes for Hawaii, and I think many of us in the LGBT legal movement had that, had high hopes. But anyway, things, you know, the whole right wing of the country moved to Hawaii and things went badly. <laughs> um, so I had been sitting there, I mean, I worked primarily in New England and for 20, five, six years, I've been at this place called Gay and Lesbian Advocates and Defenders, which is based in Boston, and I work in the New England states primarily. And, you know, people were pretty abuzz and really wanting to do things, but I am a very strategic, methodical person. So for a variety of reasons, I teamed up with some people in Vermont, and we brought a case there, the first Freedom to Marry case on the mainland um, in 1997. And we were, you know, we thought we'd covered all the bases. We really thought we were going to win. And then we were surprised and even dared to be disappointed. Uh, about the fact that the court said, you know what, you are entitled to all the same state-based rights um, that married people have, but it would leave it to the legislature to decide whether to do it in marriage or some other separate system. And suffice it to say, rather than just allow same-sex couples to participate in the same system that already existed, a new one was created called Civil Union mm -hmm. um, for the purpose of including same-sex couples alone. And I remember reading a description of this Vermont case. So right, in one sense, enormous victory, right? Uh, a state Supreme Court saying, you have to allow all the legal privileges and protections of marriage to same-sex couples. And on the other hand, they said, but we don't call it marriage. We call it civil unions. And I remember reading your description of that's a little bit like separate but equal. It, it really did feel like separate but equal, and it was bittersweet. I mean, on the one hand, same-sex couples had been entire legal strangers to one another. Mm. Not, you know, never had any kinds of comprehensive protections. You could do your own will, fabulous, but you know, no real state-based protections. So it was great to come out of that wilderness, but on the other hand, it felt like this was a step forward, but boy, we were still in the fight. So when I filed the next case, which was in the state where I was living at the time, which is Massachusetts, um, I was clear from the beginning that we were not looking for what we had in Vermont, but for marriage, the same marriage everyone else has. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in each of these cases, of course, you represent real people who really love each other. And many of them, I have to say, although not all, have children. And there's nothing to make you fight for your family like kids. Because you want, you know, just about every parent I've ever known, myself included, has really wanted their kids to have a better life than they've had. And that means to have that security as a family, which was withheld from them. So in any event, uh, we file in Massachusetts. Um, and in November of 2003, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court broke that historic barrier. And in an opinion by Chief Justice Margaret Marshall, um, basically said marriage is a vital personal right uh, and it imposes great responsibilities and great protections on people. And the Commonwealth has not come up with any, uh, any justifications here. We don't have second class citizens in Massachusetts. Yeah. And, uh, and then the battle is on. I remember you saying that was one of the most joyful days of your life. It was. It, it was. I mean, I actually, I, when I saw the opinion and I realized we had won, I thought, whoa, probably, you know, trouble ahead. Um, and of course, there was. Instantly, it took about a nanosecond for the opposition to sit in. But having said that, um, I was thrilled that we were there. And then, of course, six months later, when same sex couples started marrying, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think a lot of people have been worried, what's going to happen? Yeah. What's going to happen? The sense of trepidation. And then, of course, what happened was this outbreak of joy and just total joy. Everybody was happy. And weddings, of course, are familiar. You said you rituals. went to a lot of weddings. Those, I've been to a lot years. of weddings, yeah. yeah. A lot of joy. A lot, lot of joy. A lot of joy. But then there was backlash. So there's a complicated period of about I don't know, five, ten years or so where there was backlash. And, uh, some states passed constitutional amendments to their state's constitution, banning gay marriage. Um, others, well, including your home state of Maine, where you live with your wife and twin daughters. The legislature had passed protection for same-sex marriage, but it was overturned by referendum. So what was that like to tell your kids what had happened? Yeah, my children were in second grade at that point, and, you know, they knew we were a family. They knew our family was not in the majority. Um, but they knew we were a family, and they feel very secure, and we love them, et cetera. But we had to explain, you know, in the way you can to a second grader what was going on. And I was dreading that night. I mean, it was hard enough to lose. And I thought, how am I going to explain this to yeah. the kids? And um, finally, in the morning, I got out a map of the state. And I said, so down here in the south of the state, where a lot of people know families like ours, they understand that we're a family. 
But up here, there aren't as many people who understand that. And they already knew, because we've talked to them about other you know, ways in which our nation has had to journey to be fair to people and include people that we were on that journey to. Like, remember when they wouldn't let people go to school together? Remember yeah. when women couldn't vote? I mean, they don't remember, but you know, we talked about those things. Um, we talked about those things. So they, under, they had a framework for trying to situate this. Right. And then I just have to say, you know, myself and many others were determined to turn that around, and we did in 2012 when Maine voters flipped it and approved of marriage by the same margin we had lost. And that was sweet. How scared were you to argue in front of the Supreme Court, be honest? Quite. 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 I mean, I, yeah, I'm just going to tell you, I, I was tapped to do this. I had not expected to. I was work, working with some people from Michigan. I don't normally work in Michigan, but for various reasons, the country was going kind of haywire in a great way, a lot of marriage cases, and I was helping a lot of people, and um, I was asked to argue less than a month before the argument. Now, one thing I'll say about myself is I am a serious preparer. So it was not, opt you know, I, I thought it was very that. suboptimal in terms of preparation time. But people said to me, Mary, you've been preparing for this for 20 years. Aww. So I said, OK, fine, let's do it. Um, and you know, I knew that a bunch of them would already have a point of view about it, and I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of tough questions. But you know, I was getting questions about the Kalahari and the Chinese and um, ancient Greeks, and like, none of them really? had marriage. And I thought, well, what does that have to do with the 14th Amendment of our Constitution, which we passed in our country, uh, which says equal protection and due process for all. And I just carried that with me, um, and I carried the stories of many other people who I've known over the years with me into court and felt like uh, that's what was my job to put forth. So that was a source of strength. Barry, let me bring you into the conversation. So now we'll move from the first round of expanding families by expanding who can be married to count as a family, to um, your story about how children are brought into the world. And you have one of the most interesting stories that I've read, I have to say, about finding out um, your, your origin story. Um, this is like uh, the first generation of where Bree and Halit ended up. So, so share with the audience how you found out that you were the uh, child of a sperm provider. Yeah, it, it, it was, I, I was conceived in 1952, uh, 51, uh, actually born in 52 in the UK in England and the things were very different then. Um, and uh, it was really interesting to hear Brian Hilly because uh, I sort of feel kind of in between the two, your two attitudes towards the, the donor, but which, which is relevant I think to what I'm gonna say. But, um, I found out uh, when our, my dad died in an accident when I was 18 and our mom uh, told my sister and me uh, in one wintry night in Montreal. And it was, a, it was a real shock, you know, I mean all of a sudden you find out that what you thought was something was not that and it wasn't openness from day one and it was a shock. It was harder for my sister maybe. For me I was 18 and I was thought, oh it's kind of cool because I was made by science, not sex. I felt like I was in a science fiction film. <laughs> You know, and, and it was, I thought it was, it was sort of exciting, but then I, we also told immediately we'd never find out who the guy was. So I kind of gave up much later, um, and I should, and perhaps it'd be a bad idea just to talk about, because we were talking upstairs, about the atmosphere of secrecy. You understand that this is a very different time um, when actually the guy, who, the, the people who actually arranged for my conception published an article in the British Medical Journal in 1945. There was an immediate, what, what, what they'd been doing for a few years. And there was an immediate outcry. Uh, the House of Lords, in particular, loathed the whole thing. The House of Lords, in England, you know, they have aristocrats and they actually genetically pass on their title. So they were very upset about this. Oh, they were discussing uh, criminalizing people like my parents, like actually putting them in prison. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury condemned it. it was, he was the head of the English church. And uh, my father, strangely enough, was his physician at the time. So it was a very odd and scary thing. So that was why my father didn't want us ever to be told, because it was secret, it was shameful, it was terrible. We would have been illegitimate under law. You were mentioning about adultery upstairs. Uh, I think that was true in England too. So I would have been a bastard, as they pronounce it. And so they really didn't want us. So it was very difficult for my mother to tell. I really salute her courage in doing that. It precipitated for me um, much later a search that was because my sister had a health scare and suddenly thought, I don't know anything about my genetic history. Right. 
Um, we, it's a long story, but we, we, we set out on this journey. I, at first, was very skeptical. Um, one thing that worried me was that if I started going, as they always say, knocking on somebody's door, um, then it would ruin it for other families who wanted to have donors, because the whole system depended on absolute secrecy and absolute anonymity. Um, and I would ruin it by doing this. And so I, the first thing I did was actually go to California, and I went to the Sperm Bank of California, which was founded by uh, some lesbian women uh, there uh, who formed a cooperative, because they weren't getting served by the sperm banks who wouldn't, wouldn't, oh, right. wouldn't, wouldn't do sell thing. sperm to, to lesbians, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, well, for all those Please, reasons. Yeah. And, uh, um, and they started, and, and, and they had a, a ch donors there or vendors could have a choice of being identifiable to their offspring when the offspring grew up to be old, you know, to be mature adults. Or at least 18. 18, yeah. <laughs> That's right. It was 18. Um, or they couldn't. And 50% of them were choosing then to be identifiable. Um, it's now actually about 80 or 90, uh -huh. by the way. That's, so this whole idea that, you know, an open system would be disastrous for, for, for sperm providers, it's not true. And at the same time, Sweden came along and did the same thing. So I was satisfied enough to, to, to begin the search. Now, but beginning the search, because this is way before the days of the donor sibling registry and way before the days when the little sample comes with an identifying number on yeah, it. There were no numbers. There right? were no records. No numbers, no records at all. It was very difficult, but the, 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 the guy, the, the, this couple who, who did this, Dr. Wiesner and Mary Barton, they had a, a circle of friends. There was, there was stuff all over in libraries about them. But so wait, you, you knew from your mom where she went eventually, to get this help. Eventually we found that out. She couldn't remember the names. Okay. We worked towards that and we found that out. Um, I spent hours in libraries finding it, putting together a network of his friends who where, that's where he drew his donors. Then I'd go to their children, write them a very nice place. Excuse me, could I have some DNA? And <laughs> D, DNA testing was just beginning then really early on. In fact, so, it was much, so you, you much know cruder the, than it is you now. You know the person that your mother went to, who was a fertility researcher, and together with his wife, who was an OBGYN, am I remembering? She, they, she, she did that work. Yeah. She did that work. They, they, it turns out, were helping to provide um, insemination to, to yes. couples who were asking. So you find that out. You, you had figured that he would have used friends yes. to provide the sperm. He did, in fact. And he did. But I want people to understand how, what an incredible investigator you are. So find out who the friends yeah. of the, the researcher were yeah. and then go knock on doors and ask for DNA. Yeah, we, we, I never knocked on doors. But, but yeah, I, I mean, I wrote polite letters. But yeah, uh, abs absolutely, that's right. And amazingly enough, almost everybody said yes. They thought, wow, that's cool. Yeah, sure, that would be neat. And they're often disappointed when it came back negative. <laughs> but at any rate, eventually we did find... Um, I jumped to the end of the story. We did actually find out who he was, and uh, it who, was who was your sperm provider? who was my sperm provider, and he was in fact this guy Wiesner, who was the fertility researcher. The researcher. And then of the tw so he of the they they produced something like 1,500 babies through artificial insemination from about 1940 to about 1970, and. Um, of, we've found 20 of those, maybe 21, I can't remember right now, and about three quarters of them are Wiesners. So that so, means that I have 500, 600, possibly 1,000 half-siblings. <laughs> now, I've met 15 of them, and just to bring it back to what you guys were saying, um, it is a delight and a pleasure. It's not a replacement family for me. I have a, I have a very, very close to my sister with whom I grew up and my mom when she was alive and so forth. Not a replacement or, or anything challenged to that. It's an addition. And it's been a very delightful addition, specific, especially with uh, David Garland, who's my, my brother, who appears in that film that you've yeah. seen. Yeah. Who's, who's now, by the way, gay. But uh, that's, that's, doesn't <laughs> just really Just to bring it just, around just, to the whole just, evening. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. But, but um, this was a, a half-sibling, David, yes. that a mutual friend said, I think you should check him because the way you guys write emails is so similar. It's eerie. Yeah, that's true. 
And it turns out they were half siblings. And and it, and it's it's it brings it round to this this idea of of uh, genetics, is that it, it it's not that it's the most important thing, but it's not nothing. Mm. It means something, and to be able to see somebody you know who who is related to you physically or, or who 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 um, like David, and recognize in him certain mannerisms or habits of mind or sense of humor, mm -hmm. in his case especially, is enormously gratifying. I think we're all storytelling animals. We, 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 we like to have a story that begins someplace and goes someplace. And, mm -hmm. and for those of us who are conceived this way, who aren't told, who live in secrecy um, and anonymity, that the first chapter of that is, is kind of missing, or in some mm -hmm. cases false. Mm -hmm. Now somebody who grows up like, like uh, I, th I think, yeah. you know, it, it's very open, I think probably feels that perhaps a little less as somebody mm -hmm. who, who doesn't breathe. I'm just reading it. I don't want to, you know, tell you what you feel. But, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, there's a sense in which I, I have seen some families that have been more difficult and more to have disruptions like divorces or, in my case, a death, that have had more, been more driven to find out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, but, and so that's why, you know, and I, I, uh, I realize I'm racing a little bit the way I'm talking, mm -hmm. but uh, it, 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 it's very important. I th I, I've been an advocate for setting up an open system mm -hmm. um, where only providers of eggs or, or sperm or embryos who are willing to be identifiable to their offspring when those offspring become adults, mm -hmm. so as not to disrupt the family, um, only they should be recruited. Hmm. And there have been a lot of jurisdictions that have done this. The UK. I was going to say the UK. Partly, yeah. mm -hmm. slightly influenced by the film. Um, Sweden, most all the Nordics, most Northern European countries, Australia, New Zealand, and so forth. Uh, not my country, Canada. Um, and, and the United States, it's kind of a patchwork. There's mm. no, no legal framework really at all. But, um, well, it's, that's not true, I suppose. But, you, you know, it's, it's very much open season. So I, that's what I would like to see. And, and uh, one of the reasons is that secrecy and that shame yeah. um, is fed by the anonymity. Another important reason is the health requirements. You can take a snapshot, as we do in Canada, of the donor when he donates. But a snapshot at 18 or 20 Mm -hmm. is no substitute for an ongoing record, thing. Right. I mean, we, we, I, my, my sperm donor was an Ashkenazi Jew, and uh, we've, the BRCA gene, for instance, mm -hmm. is an important mm -hmm. thing, and there are hundreds of people who he created or co-created who don't know that yeah, or their health history. And they might be... And yeah, it's an important thing. But the most important thing for me is, or the second most important thing, is, is just that sense of identity. Like, you know, people get very upset when... Um, they take the wrong baby home from a hospital. I mean, people like it hits the front page of the newspaper. They think, well, of course, that's a terrible thing. Nobody would want that. And one time when I was making one of those films, I interviewed a young couple, a uh, lesbian couple in, in California, and they had had one baby who, um, and the, and the non-biological mother said, it's, a, it's exactly the same as if she was my child, which I totally understand. Mm -hmm. And then they said, like 30 seconds later, we want to, have another baby from, but we want it from the same donor because we want them to be, gen we want them to be real brothers and sisters. And I think you know, so th those things are a little bit antithetical, but I, I actually think that they can both be true. Yeah, it is, but it is so fascinating. I think one of the issues that all of uh, the assisted reproduction, we can turn to you, Susan, to help with this, is a sort of vexed relationship to genetics. Um, tendencies to think it's too important, tendencies to think it's not important at all. I like what you said, Barry, about our being meaning-making or storytelling creatures. We're, we're, things are in flux enough right now that the meaning or story of genetics, I think, is really unclear. So, and, and, and sorry, mm -hmm. just you were saying earlier about the word real, you know, the real father. Mm -hmm. There is like... You and, said you and, used to get annoyed when people would say, oh, you're searching for your real Oh, father. so who is your real dad? Yeah. Like, oh. And I felt like that's an insult to my father. Of course. Who was my father? And, and, and yet, and yet the, the whole idea of real isn't binary, you know? It's a complex thing. Yeah. Reality is a complex thing. They were... I had a genetic father and I had a parenting father and a father. Yes. So, Susan, let me um, yeah. turn to you. 
um, you uh, established one of the first law firms back in the day in the late 80s that um, helped people build families through adoption, uh, gamete provision, sperm and egg donation, and surrogacy arrangements. Um, and now you consult a lot of uh, policymakers on best practices here. So you've been there from the beginning of the law trying to grapple with some of these new arrangements. And, and I'm thinking here in particular of whether straight or gay couple um, using assisted reproduction, which means you're going to bring a third party into the equation. Right? Here are the intending parents. Let's imagine it's two. But you're going to get somebody else to provide a gamete, egg or sperm, or somebody else to gestate the baby. And I can imagine that that's been complex for the law to try to kind of wrap its head around. Am, am I guessing correctly? Absolutely. I mean, the law is a creature of habit. And I often laugh and say, you know, the assisted reproductive technologies, the doctors are just going to go do it, and the scientists. And then the law is going to try to catch up really fast and not sure how to do it. Yeah. And we started out with family units. I mean, we've all talked about the importance of family, and the law is there to protect families. And you know, I hope it's there to protect children. The families is, you know, sort of my mission. But as you started building these unique ways of making families, you suddenly had the law kind of saying, well, we're not sure what to do with this. Uh -huh. You know, my practice intentionally combined adoption and reproductive technology, and one of the things I found was we have a very rich framework around adoption. We understand when somebody wants to transfer parentage from one birth parent to another adoptive parent and make yeah. a new family, and the law protects that. And when you have a nuclear family, the law knows how to protect that. A married couple, man and woman only, back in the dark ages, has right. a child. And then we start with artificial insemination. It was the very first technology. And the law's first reaction was, we must protect this family. And that means we must protect the fiction that this husband is the father. Is and the genetic father. Is the legal father is for legal, all purposes the and yes. therefore must be the biological father. So structures were put in place. And you have to keep in mind, family law is state specific. Uh -huh. So everybody has to follow the U.S. Constitution, but as long as it's constitutional, every state can make up their own law. And as I often tell my students, every state is absolutely confident they know the best law. <laughs> so every state has the best law. And there are 46 states that have donor sperm statutes, and they were all built around the fiction that if you're a heterosexual married couple and the, the wife has a baby, that baby must belong to the husband. And if you used artificial insemination, we need a law that says a child born to a married couple through artificial insemination with the consent of the husband is deemed a child of the marriage. Uh -huh. And nobody else needs to know. And that's part of the whole secrecy and lack of, you know, and lack of openness that was part of this, because otherwise you're a bastard. You know, if you're born out of wedlock, you are not a good person back in the old days. And so merit, protecting marital units and protecting family was critical. And then you start introducing egg donation and surrogacy and different types of surrogacy, traditional, where you're being artificially inseminated and that woman is the biological mother, okay. looking a lot like a birth mother and looking a lot like those adoption laws should apply. And then we get to gestational surrogacy where you take an embryo from a couple or donors, and you put that into the woman who carries, who's not biologically related. Okay, so slow, me, slow down on the gestational care. So these days, and this really is interesting given what we've said about people's vexed relationships to genetics. Exactly. So, so tell me if I've got it right. So I love the phrase traditional surrogacy, as though that was the yeah. some lengthy tradition. Yeah. So, but so what, what many of us might think of as a, as a surrogate, uh, thinking some of us remember the, the baby M case back back in the day. Um, those would be cases where here's the couple that wants to parent a child, but the woman for some reason can't carry a pregnancy. So they're going to contract with a woman to carry the pregnancy, but in, in those days it was the husband's sperm, but the surrogate's egg. Am I, have I got it Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So we're going to just use his sperm to make this woman pregnant, right? conceive a baby, carry the baby, determine, then let this uh, couple rear the child. And, and I think what I'm understanding, and we've talked about this before, um, there was so much complexity emotionally, but certainly legally, about wasn't the, the surrogate really the mother? <laughs> she was the genetic mother, it was her egg. She was the gestator, she gave birth, and for, for often in the law, if you gave birth to a baby, then the one thing we know is that you're the mother. And so then what, what moved people from that, that notion of traditional onto what you're calling gestational well, two, surrogacy? Two things, I think. First of all, IVF. 
became possible before in vitro fertilization, and keep in mind our first IVF baby was 1978 in the UK, okay. that you couldn't have a surrogacy arrangement that wasn't that, simply artificial insemination. There was no the technology possible to put an I embryo see. into another person. I see. And so every surrogate arrangement was a tradition, what we now call a traditional surrogate. And only when IVF came on board was there the possibility of asking a woman to carry a child for you if you as a, just take the easiest case, a heterosexual couple who had sperm and eggs, yes, I but see. didn't have a, a uterus that could carry, right. or a health, you know, it was, a, it was a health risk to the mother, to the wife to do that. Yeah. You would ask someone to carry that child for you. So it was the first time okay. we could absolutely separate a woman who could be pregnant from the biological possibility that she was not the, the only mother we could have. I see. And the other thing that is sort of a fascinating to me juxtaposition is a traditional surrogate has been artificially inseminated with no intention to be the mother. Right. Your mother was artificially inseminated with every intention to be the mother. So you can have a woman who's standing there pregnant with a man's sperm that is not her husband's and a totally different legal paradigm surrounds them depending on their intention. I see. Which is why I think we've moved into this new era, if you will, of intentionality becoming a more important factor in family building than it ever was in the dark ages when we had these first sets of laws. You know, we just knew who the mom and the dad were, and yeah. we just knew whose baby that was. And yeah. now we have to kind of peel back the layers and make some much more nuanced set of legal frameworks if we're going to protect these families. So what is the status of surrogacy legally, like in the United States or around the world? So in the United States, again, every state has the best law. So it's state-specific. Traditional surrogacy is almost virtually considered to be a, a birth mother and an adoption must apply. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do a traditional surrogacy, which means artificial insemination, it's not necessarily illegal, but that woman who carries the child is the legal mother mm -hmm. until and unless she agrees to an adoption plan. A mm -hmm. couple of states different, but that's basically mm -hmm. it. And it's, it's one of the two reasons I think people move towards gestational surrogacy. It's also that piece that you mentioned. Genetics is something. It's important to people. If they can have a baby with their own genetics, they probably would like to try to do that. Mm -hmm. Also, gestational surrogacy on, from a legal framework lets you start separating the That's roles right. of these women. So if you're carrying a child that's not your biological child, it becomes easier for the law to say, well, so wait a second. That's your egg and your sperm, and you intended to be the parent. So it's your genetics, it's your intention, mm. and all this woman has now is gestation and no intent to be a mother. And so we have had a tremendous change in the law where most, not all, but most states recognize gestational surrogacy as a method to have a child, recognize the intended parents as the parents. Even before the birth happens? Upon birth, because um, okay. we can't be a parent until we have a child. Okay, that makes sense. But they can do the legal work in advance that it attaches as soon as that baby is born, which is important, because you don't want babies in limbo. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the no, whole that's... reasons why we lawyers work so hard on this, is that we want these kids to have you know, legal security when they're born. And so the, the laws are pretty good about saying that is a child of these people and not of the woman who delivers. The problem we have is when everyone starts to disagree. Well, actually, that's what I was just about to ask. So that really sounds nice when everybody's getting along really well. Um, but I can imagine, uh, I mean, families fight over remotes, <laughs> like who gets to change the channel on the TV. So I'm kind of guessing that there might be disagreements sometimes. So, so what happens when, maybe share with us a, a, a court case that, uh, in your experience, where, where there have been some fights or battles. Let's say the, the, the surrogate wants to do something different from the intended well, I mean, there are two pretty ups, uh, worrisome ones going on right now. And so, as I said, family law is the best law if it's my state, but I have to comply with the U.S. Constitution. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Constitution is pretty clear that a pregnant woman controls her own body. She decides whether to be pregnant. I like that. Hmm? I like that. Yeah. Okay. Whether she, you know, to be pregnant, to continue being pregnant, or to terminate a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. When you become a surrogate, you enter into a contract usually that says, I will do what you want me to do. Those agreements aren't worth the paper they're printed on if it comes down to a disc in forcing someone to do it. It's not going to happen. You know, you can fight maybe over the terms, but you're not going to fight over whether a w pregnant woman decides to continue or terminate a pregnancy. Two cases right now in which a, two surrogates are pregnant with triplets, gestational surrogates and they are disagreeing with their intended parents as to whether to reduce those pregnancy. So selective reduction is where you go in and you terminate one of those fetuses. 
And the primary reason you do it is that multifetal pregnancies are really dangerous. They're dangerous, mm -hmm. they're dangerous for the pregnant woman, they're and dangerous the for the kids, mm -hmm. they're dangerous for their lifelong disabilities, issues yeah. that may arise. And so it's a logical thing to do, but it's also a much better idea to just not have the problem in the first place. And so somehow these people have all gotten together and somehow they have come out into this situation that is pretty bad mm -hmm. where two, of the, two women are carrying triplet pregnancies, the intended parents want them to reduce to twins and they're saying no. So follow the collision in law that's happening here. Okay. Family law deals with things like who counts as the parent, who gets custody and the like. Contract law deals with promissory arrangements between people that the law is supposed to enforce. So what you're talking about is when we have contract law over family matters, right? And so you and I have talked about this, that you can see uh, legal the legal contracts for surrogacy arrangement will include all sorts of things like, and the parties all agree that if, if, if three of the embryos take and there are triplets, that there will be a reduction to one, or alternatively, you can get a rate surrogacy contract that says, in the case of, uh, even in the case of, you know, a, a, a dis an anomaly being found, there will be no abortion. Right. And the clash that happens when you realize the law can't, and I hope you follow this, shouldn't be able to force the surrogate to either have or not have an abortion. You can't contract away your constitutional rights. You see what I mean? And yet, and, and pause, full stop, you can't contract away your constitutional rights, even if you want to, okay? That's why they're constitutional. And yet, you've also talked about, it doesn't make it easy, right? Because, like, let's say a, a, a surrogate decides, you know what, this is a very difficult pregnancy and I'm going to go ahead and have an abortion. Right? Maybe I've got hypermesis where I'm it's throwing up the, the extent of chemotherapy, okay? Oh, but it looks here, it says I'm not allowed to do that, right? But you can also feel for the contracting or intentional couples, that's their embryo, and they're growing, you know, embryo in there. So that just feels like a disaster waiting to happen to me. It is. It's, 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 it's a terrible situation you should avoid. I mean, what I always tell every client, every clinic is, you don't get in bed with the wrong person. You know, literally or figuratively. Okay. If you can't get on, you know, if you're you really going to make a baby people? with somebody, make sure you all completely and totally agree because if and when there's a problem like this, yeah. you can't fix, the lawyers can't the law, fix it. The law actually can't. Right. right. The, law, the law can throw, talk, you know, talk around breach of contract, how much money is it going to cost you if you do this or that, and it can threaten people. But at the end of the day, you have a disaster on your hands and yeah. the best advice is to avoid it, mm -hmm. to go into these relationships much more respectfully. And to, I mean, I don't, what I don't understand in both of those cases is how these women got pregnant with triplets. It shouldn't be happening in today's medical community. There mm -hmm. shouldn't be more than, in my opinion, a single embryo transfer. That is the recommendation now. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a double embryo transfer. In one, they, they did two and it split, which is another reason why there shouldn't have been two. And wow. the other, the couple and they all agreed, let's put in three. One of them looks kind of crappy. To, to make sure we get, some, we get a baby at the end. Well, they said one doesn't look so good, so we might as well throw that one in too, because it's otherwise going to sit in the freezer by itself. And it's not going to take. And they all agreed. And my oh. question, as a lawyer, which maybe I'm not allowed to ask ethical questions as a lawyer, is what... I hope you ask ethical <laughs> questions as a lawyer. <laughs> I'm always told it's an oxymoron. But, <laughs> but what doctor agreed to do this, no matter, what the, well, no matter what the intended parents and the surrogate agreed, and she did. She was a 46-year-old surrogate who said, I've had twins, it's been no problem, I'm willing, I'm ready to do this, let's go for it. And the intended parent was like, okay, let's go for it. The doctor needed to put the brakes on yeah, and just say no. Yeah. And we're not doing this. And we're not doing this because this is what could happen. I know you all probably have some questions. So let's go ahead and ask Halid and Bree to come back to the stage. And we'll open it up to hear what, what questions you'd like to ask of the panelists. While Bree and Halid are coming up, you were just talking about um, the, the one embryo would be left frozen. Yep. So this is, I know, another just really amazing, crazy thing. But there are, oh wait, pause. Sure. I think I'm supposed to move. So there now, you could sit there, I think. I can sit. 
like frozen embryos hanging out. And you were telling me about one case. This was not with a third party reproduction, but a couple freezing their own embryo to use for later. Anybody see in the, in the um, newspaper today that what the Pentagon's latest employee benefit is? They'll pay for um, women and men to freeze their eggs and sperm to use later. So I, I want you to follow this. The Pentagon has now joined Facebook, who offered that benefit a year ago. <laughs> Weird. So anyway, then things are hanging out in, in, in the freezer. So frozen embryos have been an issue forever. And they're also a wonderful way to make families. I made one with a frozen embryo, and I'm thrilled to have done it. There are also extra embryos when people finish treatment or people get divorced. And then suddenly the ones that they had in the freezer that they were going to use when they were a loving couple become the ones they're going to fight over because one wants them and one doesn't. And the last thing either of them want is to have one with the other one. So there's a case that just came out in California in which a woman is fighting to have her embryos from her marriage, claiming that she is, you know, very sadly... To she use has, them. To use them to, to make use them. Baby. She has a breast cancer survivor. She, froze em she made embryos in anticipation that she would be infertile. And she and her husband signed very clear documents with the program saying, if we divorce, we will discard the embryos. Uh -huh. And she changed her mind. Mm -hmm. And she says, I want them. They're my last chance embryos. I'm not going to be a biological genetic mother. Genetics mean something to me. I want those embryos. They're my babies. And the husband is kind of looking at all the paperwork and saying, well, this is what we signed. We talked about it. We agreed. We counseled. This is the agreement. And they were off to court. And but why is that a, a, a case? I mean, I would have thought because it's not in her body, she, she can't, the, it's not the argument of the integrity of the body that's that it right. would be with a pregnancy. You it's quite court. different. That's right. <laughs> and in fact, that's how the court in the past has ruled, that the, the husband, and understand his position, he's not trying to be mean, but he's arguing the right not to reproduce. He's taking seriously, if she has those children, they're, they're mine, I should be a father. I don't want to, and we agreed that we wouldn't do this if we couldn't do it together. And in fact, the courts have defended the right not to reproduce over. And, and he won the case ultimately, but not without a four-day trial, not without the doctors being cross-examined, saying, how many embryos did you kill this week by her oh. lawyer? Not without an appeal that is being um, based on the fact that embryos are babies. And it's not the only case that's going on. I don't know how many of you follow People Magazine, but Nick Loeb is going after Sofia Vergara. Did you his really just embryos. cite People Magazine? Yes. <laughs> it's a respected legal source. <laughs> <laughs> Let me pause you there and see who has some questions for the panel. Hi, thank you so much for the conversation so far. Um, so one thing that is really interesting about um, thinking about genetics is it's kind of this nebulous meaning-making thing, but we don't quite know why, but it seems like there's some story to be told. And I was wondering if um, people that have found meaning in their genetics, like in their genetic origin story, mm -hmm. if there's anything to think about um, genetic enhancements and how genetic enhancements are going to change that sort of meaning um, that people have to their uh, genetic identity and their genetic affiliation. You must have taken a bioethics class. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let Barry actually, you, you had just been talking about CRISPR and your worries there. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I, we're not there yet, of course, but the technology is there and could be, especially, I think, this week, you probably know the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority in the United Kingdom authorized mm -hmm. work on, on, uh, on embryos, which would not be turned into Editing human beings. Their genome, Editing right? their genome. Ge Editing the genome, inserting bits or taking out bits mm -hmm. to, see, to, to see how the genome works. It's research. It's very good research. Um, but I, 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 don't, I, I don't know what those future babies who can fly and have brainiacs will, will be like or what, the, or what they'll, their needs are, but I do think we should listen to them should they ever arrive and they maybe will tell us what their needs are. So I, I would say whether, what their needs for connection or family are. And just quickly, I'd say the most important reason for me that I think that it's important to be open about the process and for people to know who they're connected to is that because we've separated 
the, uh, the, the acts of conception, because we've instrumentalized it or sometimes commodified it, but because we've just done IVF, taken it out of the, out of the act of sex, and there's a danger, I think, of, of, losing, of losing connection with the past and the future, and, and I think those connections in, in the present and in the, to the past and to the future are really important, and it's not that I want to sort of think they're the only important thing, but I just think they should be respected. So it's not an absolutist sort of, that it's the only thing that matters, and we shouldn't ever interfere with nature. We should just, we should be absolutely man, woman, the only people to marry. It's not, not that at all. But it is important maybe to, going forward into those sort of technologies, to have respect for our connections. Does that make sense? It's not properly, I think there's a better way to say that. Yeah, no, I think it's really challenging um, and exciting, actually, to think about um, expanding ways in which the past gets connected to the future. Okay, so, so people are used to the idea of uh, creation being uh, anchored to one scenario, let's say a heterosexual couple where they're, you know, the act of conception is sexual intercourse. So there's one a very available, easy narrative to, to figure out how you're connected to your past and how you're connected to your lineage. It's through that story. But I, I do think through human history, there have been lots of different ways that people have a sense of genealogy that, that can include things like you know, adoption. That's my story. It's not you know, following the gamete. It's you know, following, and then I arrived into the family this way. So I, I think there are lots of fascinating ways to have a, a genealogy or lineage story that don't have to necessarily track that, that mm -hmm. one we're Absolutely. most used to. And you've talked eloquently about this as well. Please. No. Yeah, I just want to tell another part of this. It's law, but um, it's, okay. it's a, perhaps a parallel story to what you're talking about in terms of the genetic stories or genealogy stories. So in the, in the law, there's this line of cases, including out of the Supreme Court and in many states, that says genetics does not make a parent. Okay, and it comes up primarily in the context where a man has had a child, you know, I don't know what circumstances, sounds like a, not a big Back relationship. Back to your car. Right, whatever. Um, and she goes on with her life and perhaps meets somebody, and then he shows up later on and says, I'm the father. And um, I'm going to not consent to this adoption, I'm not mm -hmm. going to consent to this and the other thing. And the courts say, you know, sorry, you know, you need to have asserted your rights and been a parent um, and tried to form a relationship with the child. And so biology is not by itself enough. And there's another line of cases, and this comes up a lot in the state area, and Susan's so right about how family law is so different state by state, but there's, there are an awful lot of cases in a lot of states where a man has acquiesced to the role of father. Um, he knows he might not be, or maybe he was completely hoodwinked, by the woman, whatever it might be, but he's acquiesced to the role of father and discovers now because of the availability of um, mm, genetic testing that he's not, the couple's separated or he's gotten slapped with a bigger child support order and doesn't want to have to pay, gets that test and says, I'm out of here, I'm not the genetic dad. Uh -huh. And again, the courts are saying, sorry, conduct matters and the thing to me that I want to bring into the conversation is not just your conduct and having acted as a parent, the thing that belongs in the conversation in part is the best interest of the child yes, and people are going to disagree about what that means but one thing that's really clear is continuity for children mm -hmm. um, around their, you know, when their parent figures really matters and the cor courts have been lifting that up more and more. So I don't know exactly how that intersects with what you're saying, but I do think it's just another important piece of this, which is thinking about, as the law puts it, the best interest of the child, particularly when there's been these established parent-child relationships. Yeah. If I could add on to that, Mary. Oh, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, I think the way I would say it connects is that for that same sense of continuity, you expand the picture and you say continuity of parenting is critical, but continuity of, continuity, continuity of knowing where you come from is also important and that's where the donor conception pieces come in and the whole idea of having registries or ways for people to know where they come from and adoptees, the open records. Mm. So there's the continuity of parenting is critical and then there's that I want to know from whence I came. I like that. And those, those are separate resonate things. with you guys. About Absolutely well, separate I things. Think but one, I think one they're, is about yeah. childhood and the other is, I would say, is about maturity and, major and, for, for an, and, and adulthood. And a sense of identity. Did you all have senses that um, you've said that 
your sense of who your parents were? For neither of you, the, 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 the idea of a, a sperm donor, that didn't upset any apple cart about who your parents were. For us? Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I think, I mean, I know who my parents are. I, I have a mom, I have another mom, and I have a dad. <laughs> and Go you. Yeah, so, and we make it work. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I agree. I think the sperm donor is a completely different person, um, not related to our parents. And I think even the siblings who do have a really big urge to search for him, mm -hmm. I don't think anyone wants that because they think he's going to be this guy who's going to come in and be their father and take them out to dinner. I don't know. That's the only thing I could think <laughs> yeah. of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think, it, I think it's easy to separate it when you grow up with people who love you and who raise you. Right. I wouldn't want that from him and I wouldn't ask that of him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One person talked to me about the difference between parent as a noun, a parent, and parent as a verb, to parent. And the parent is actually the person who's been doing the parenting. Mm -hmm. yep. And it doesn't mean that the genetic progenitor might not be of deep interest. Mm -hmm. I love the from whence did I come. That's fantastic too. All right. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Mary, I was just wondering, is your sister from a surrogate? I don't have is a sister. It, no, no, wait. Barry? The, uh, this is Barry. Mary Barry. 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 Yeah, Barry. Barry. Oh, his <laughs> sister. <laughs> yes, we were oh, sorry. You said you had a sister. Yeah, yeah. Did you, was your sister also? She was also produced by, uh, by artificial insemination. Uh, the same guy? No, actually, we thought it was, and then... Later, it turned out it was a different guy. It was Wiesner's number one star donor. He had, he, he had about a, between 100 and 200 children or offspring. And she knows who he is, too. And she's connected, too, to all his, to his natural children. Oh, I hate that word. I don't have a better one. Yes, yes. Vocabulary is hard here. Yes. Uh, thank you all. I'd like to hear some of your thoughts on trans reproductive rights, especially with the example of, say, a trans man who still has, you know, a woman all the re reproductive capacities in order to carry a pregnancy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just start by just saying I, it's not something I know a ton about, except that I certainly know people who are in that exact situation and have exercise the reproductive capacity. And, you know, I'm familiar with more and more medical practices that are making sure that um, trans people get the, the medical and reproductive health services that they need. Yeah. I agree. I think it's um, the exact same with anyone, no matter how you're born, who you identify as, um, who your family is, who you consider your family. I think if it makes you comfortable or if it's if the way that you're going to conceive a child is what is important to you and what I guess is best for you, then that's all that matters and that's all that really should matter. Um, again, I don't know much in the background of the law or academically, um, but I think it, you can relate it to any of our situations and I think love is the most important thing. and. If that's what rules in your relationship and that's what rules when you're trying to have a child, that's what's important. Um, I'm sorry if that didn't answer your question, but okay. in my personal opinion, it, it doesn't really matter and it's hard for people to see that right now, um, especially in the trans movement today. But it's all about education and it's all about giving people the opportunity to talk to people who are dissimilar than them, mm -hmm. who have different upbringings and who identify as um, not different people but in a different way than you may and I think if people speak out and can educate others about what they're feeling and what they believe that will lead to a lot more equality and love and um, we always laugh at the word love but it really is important and I think everyone in the audience understands that in a different way and in a very personal way and for me it shouldn't matter who you are um, if you're comfortable with something and you want to do something in a, in a loving way then that's all that really should affect it. 
And if I can just add one thing, I'm sitting here in my mind trying to think, am I missing any law that I'm not aware of? And I don't think, I'm not aware of any, I hope this is true, I'm not aware of any law that um, restricts That's access uh, to right. production for trans persons. Having said that, um, I can imagine that there are, in this nation of ours, that there would be doctors and so on who wouldn't um, want to provide assistance. Yeah. Yes, I was going to say on, on an encouraging note, okay. I can tell you from a legal and medical perspective, there was a case in which a uh, trans male su uh, brought a discrimination claim because the medical program did not want to treat him the same as they would have treated a woman who came in for artificial insemination, and he uh -huh. won that case. The other thing that I think is fascinating, and it goes in part to how much same-sex family building uh, progress we've made is that a number of states now say parent parent on the birth certificate instead of mother father and so the law has stopped worrying about where how they would categorize somebody I think who comes in as a single parent and Which I know help the trans I, person too. a trans person and I have been on training programs where the doctors are telling each other here's how we have to open our practices uh -huh. up and when we have trans patients and same-sex couples how we need to be more sensitive so I think there's been a tremendous amount of progress in this area in the last couple of years, and it's very heartening. Heartening. Yes, over here. Hi. Um, thank you very much for coming. I'm really enjoying the conversation. Um, I spent a lot of time last semester talking about the providing of egg freezing and healthcare benefits for, um, like, I think Facebook and mm -hmm. Apple and now the Pentagon, mm -hmm. apparently. Um, <laughs> but I'm wondering if you guys have any more thoughts on that? I would love to hear, especially the lawyers talk about it a little bit. Um, I wonder if it brings up any complications from a legal perspective. Um, we talked about it a lot from an ethical one, but I'd love mm -hmm. to hear you guys talk more. Susan? Um, egg freezing in particular you're talking about? Yeah. And offering it. I think there are a lot of issues around egg freezing, and I talk about it a lot with my students, all of whom want to do it, by the way. <laughs> I think some of the legal, I think, I think some of the issues are the following. We're still, per, we're still perfecting the technology and we will be for a while. So I think marketing egg freezing for your own fertility preservation to young women who have many years to go before they need to worry about this is somewhat misleading. I think it would be a stretch, but I can see a claim down the road saying, you know, I was misled. I spent a lot of money to freeze my eggs when I could have waited five more years and still had plenty of fertility and might have met Mr. or Ms. Wright and didn't need this. You also have to not only freeze your eggs, but then you have to pay for the services of keeping them frozen. Mm -hmm. And once you've done it once, usually the doctors will tell you, you know, we probably should do it more than once so that you have enough to really count on in case you need them. So I think there's a, there's a concern about exploitation. I think there's a concern that it's gonna be better two years from now, three years from now. And so if you're not on the cusp of, you know, the cliff that, you know, the biological clock cliff, I think there are issues around doing it before you get there. Having said that, I should say there's a huge benefit of egg freezing over embryo freezing for women who are doing things like facing fertility compromising treatments like oncofertility is you do not have to worry about those embryo disputes I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be transformative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I also just ask medically, to harvest the eggs, aren't we doing hyperstimulation of the ovaries? So there, there are medical risks involved in doing this? There are medical, yes, and I'm sorry, I just sort of glit, slid over No, no, that. I just, so you're absolutely right. I mean, then. there are medical risks, I think, the cases of hyperstimulation are rare, okay. but it's not risk-free. And there are also people who are out there saying that we don't know the long-term risks on egg, don egg donation, which means egg retrievals, you know, repeated egg retrievals. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's not been going on long enough to know that. We, one more person down here. I have a question for Mary. So there's um, a lot of states now that have insurance coverage for medical infertility, and some states even cover IVF, but for same-sex couples, they're sort of situ situationally infertile, and where is the law in terms of uh, covering insur uh, health care for same-sex couples? Susan, you're going to help me out on this, right? Um, so should we take insurance first, and then we'll deal with perhaps tax deductions? Um, <laughs> so on, insur insurance. on insurance, it's going to be a matter of state law. Um, and, it, and I think it's 15 states, right, that require coverage on a non-discriminatory basis for, so. 15, 15 states that have some degree of mandatory coverage for infertility treatment. Yes, on a non-discriminatory basis. Yes, but then you have to decide what is infertility. True. And so if it's a, med if it's a medical definition, then medical infertility is covered, but a same-sex couple who presents who don't have a source of their infertility 
even in a state like Massachusetts, which is as good as it gets, which has mandatory infertility coverage, a same-sex female couple has to show that they have tried to get pregnant for a year unsuccessfully before they will be diagnosed as infertile to be covered, right? <laughs> And that could be exposing themselves to sperm counts. No, I mean, you have to pay out of pocket. You have to try. You have to try mm -hmm. in the yeah. way that it would... As opposed to just sit there, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think we're light years behind in terms of covering for same-sex couples. And it, it, it raises this question, I'm glad you said all that, because it raises this question of how do you define infertility? Exactly. Because there is the medical definition in a way, but there's also a way of looking at it. My partner cannot help me conceive, you know, create a pregnancy. And that, is that enough? Um, you know, in light of whatever other policies we think are out there about family building and so on. So I, I do think this is an area that's going to be developing, and it's also spilled over already into the area of um, there's a part of the Internal Revenue Code that says when you, um, you know, to use money to, for medical treatment to, you know, part function of the body, whatever it might be, uh, or, or to treat a disease, then you can, you know, deduct those expenses from your taxes. And a case has been filed in Florida to that effect, and I've been asked many times to look at this and trying to figure that out too. So, but it all does end up revolving around this idea of um, what are we talking about when we're talking about infertility. And so I, this shift of framework that may be overdue. The first battle with fertility assistance was at least getting insurance to help everybody who had biological or medical infertility. Right? And that's been a long battle. And has come a long way, but at an expense of tying our thought in law and in medicine of what infertility is to a biological diagnosis. Something is wrong with your ovaries or your testes or something like that. As opposed to, and I know Susan has written beautifully about this, shifting to an idea of access to fertility assistance, which doesn't have, you don't have to need the, the, the reason you need assistance doesn't have to be a medical diagnosis. It's just access to assistance in family building. Mm -hmm. So that really may be the next framework we need to move to. I think we have time for one more question. One more question. But also a commercial. Um, <laughs> if you are interested in the topics that were raised here, um, please come use the Bioethics Research Library. Mm -hmm. I know that they have resources because our reference librarian was answering a question on transgendered reproduction and came up with yeah. two reports that just uh, did research that uh, there's no difference in quality of children's life between transgender parents. Mm -hmm. um, so please come. There's a lot of information there and you can uh, find enough to be a good advocate. So here's our last question. Hey guys, uh, thank you all for being here, by the way. Um, this is kind of a, a broader question about law in general, but Maggie, feel free to jump in, because I think ethics as a check is kind of good context for the mm -hmm. question. Um, throughout the conversation, we've kind of talked about how there's a kind of general scientific innovation, and then the law struggles to kind of catch up to that. Mm -hmm. um, as the regularity of innovation continues to accelerate, and the law stays at the same pace, do you see kind of uh, a schism occurring where those two fields uh, become harder to reconcile? And um, you know, how does that affect the kind of long-term future of everything we've talked about here tonight? So maybe I'll take this one um, just and try to speak for everyone. But it is a fantastic question. And there's a way in which the field of bioethics, which is what the Kennedy Institute focuses on, is really about the question you asked. Yeah. That, um, uh, what happens when there's a gap between our figuring out that we can do something and thinking about whether we should or legally how to do it in a way that protects everyone. And you're exactly right, the pace of that innovation has accelerated and probably will continue to. So I do think there's encouraging news about the kinds of um, uh, groups that governments are pulling together, including international groups that come together as, for instance, as soon as CRISPR, which is that gene editing technique, it emerged as possible, which was, I want to say 18 months ago, right? The person who was working on fungi and figured out how to do this. And everybody goes, oh my gosh, we can now do genetic engineering of embryo, hum, human embryos. And immediately we've got amazing, incredibly good panels all over the world looking at this, including with community involvement to get their, to get their idea. And I, so I think there's more experience with ways to thoughtfully 
have oversight of some of this science, but you know, watch this space. This is why, this is why the world needs bioethics. Mm -hmm. Hey, hi. Oh, what a good ending. Go, me. Thank you, everybody, and thank our panelists.